All right, so what we're looking at today is the next page in your notes dealing with the motions of the moon. Now, um, the movement of various bodies gives us units of time. So like one Earth rotation is a day, one Earth revolution is a year. Uh, the motions of the moon give us a unit of time as well. Uh, the motions of the moon give us the unit of the month. Uh, now, the original like scientific month is not exactly the same as the calendar month anymore. Um, it's like some months of, you know, February's got 28 days, January's got 31 days and so forth. Um, but that's where the unit, the month originally came from is the, the amount of time from one new moon to the next new moon and so forth. Um, now how the moon moves, well, the moon basically revolves around the earth. It's not exactly, but cause they actually kind of, uh, revolve a little bit around each other. But since the earth is, uh, a lot more massive than the moon is. The moon's more so going around the earth than the earth is going around the moon. So we'll just say the moon revolves around the earth. And the amount of time it takes to do that, it takes 27 and a third days for the moon to go around the earth once. All right. Now, um, an interesting thing about that is the moon rotates at the same rate as it revolves. So the same side the moon always faces the earth. So whenever you look at the moon, you always see the, the same craters and stuff. It doesn't matter you know, during a full moon or a quarter moon or what time of the month or anything. You're always seeing the same craters and you know, the other stuff on the moon as well. And, that, and that's because it rotates and revolves at the same time. So how that works is... So let's say here's the uh, Earth, and here's the Moon, all right? And let's say that black dot there is a crater on the Moon, all right? And now, let's say that the Moon did not rotate at all, all right? It just revolved around the Earth, all right? Now, if the Moon did not rotate at all, it just revolved, the crater's facing this way, now the crater would still be facing that way, crater be facing that way, the crater be facing that way. So if the moon did not uh, rotate at all, then if I'm from the earth, I would see this side of the moon when the moon was over here, and I'd see the back side of the moon when the moon was on the other side. But that's not the case. We're always seeing the same side. We're always seeing the same craters. So what happens is, Um, as the moon revolves a quarter of the way around like that, what happens is it also rotates a quarter of the way around. So as it goes a quarter of the way this way, it also rotates a quarter of the way that way. So that rotates like that, so that crater is still facing the Earth. And then as it revolves this way, the moon rotates that much as well. So again, that crater is still facing the Earth. And as it revolves this way, it rotates or spins the exact same amount, so that crater is still facing the Earth. So as the moon is revolving around the Earth, it is also rotating at the exact same speed. So we always see the same side of the moon. Uh, be the apparent diameter of the moon varies in a cyclic manner. Uh, so sometimes in the month the moon looks a little bigger, other times a little bit farther, a little bit smaller. And that's because the moon does not travel in a perfect circle around the Earth. Rather, it travels in an ellipse, which is kind of like an oval. So sometimes they're a little bit closer, other times a little bit farther away. That would make the moon a little bit bigger and a little bit uh, smaller. C. Uh, gravity from the moon and the sun causes the tides. Right? Uh, now, the sun's a lot bigger than the moon is. So you'd think the sun would have a, a bigger influence on the Earth's tides in the moon. But even though the moon's smaller, it's a lot closer. Uh, so even though in the grand scheme of things it, it has less gravity because it's smaller, we get more of an effect from it because we're closer to it. Right? The sun has a lot of gravity, but it's really far away. But a combination of those two is what causes the tides on the Earth. 
Now, um, how do we get the tides? All right, so this is the diagram that's on the back of your note sheet. So let's say here's the moon going around the earth. Here's the sun right there. And let's say there is the ocean right there. So this drawing is grossly exaggerated. Uh, so let's say the moon's in position D, all right? What's happening is the gravity from the moon is pulling that way. Gravity from the sun is pulling that way. So I have these two forces of gravity pulling apart on the earth like that. So stuff like water or the air, there's, there's tides in the atmosphere too, are able to move. So what's gonna happen if it's pulling this way is the water here and here is gonna go up. And then if that water's rising, then the water here and here is gonna have to go down. So you're gonna end up with something, and again, this is gonna be grossly exaggerated, that is kind of like this. And again, this, this is really exaggerated. Um, where here and here the water's higher, and here and here the water went lower, right? So if I'm on this part of the earth right now, I'm experiencing high tide here. I'm over here, I'm experiencing high tide. Here and here, I'm experiencing low tides. So during the course of the day, during one earth rotation, uh, you're normally going to experience two high tides and two low tides. Uh, the amount of time to go from a high tide to a low tide is roughly around six hours. The amount of time it goes from one high tide to the next high tide is usually around is about 12 hours or so. All right, so that's how you get the tides. Now, sometimes, depending where you are, because the other things that affect the tides has to do with the like, geography and the shape of the coastlines and stuff like that too. But there's some places on Earth where um, the tides are really huge. Um, probably the best example is this place in New Brunswick, Canada, uh, a little bit north of Maine, called the Bay of Fundy, where, um, you know, since it's just six hours from there to there, you know, it's not that much time, uh, the ocean level can change around 30 feet from here to here, which is a huge amount, huge, huge change in sea level over a pretty short amount of time. Um, but again, a lot of it's, the, you know, some places the uh, the coastline kind of funnels the water in so you can get a bigger effect from it and stuff. But anyways, so when you're going to get the biggest tides, the highest high tides and the lowest low tides, is when the sun, the earth, and the moon are all lined up in a straight line like that. That's when you're going to get the biggest tides. Now, if the, um, if the moon's at position C and position A, then what happens is the gravity from the moon's pulling this way, the gravity of the sun's pulling that way. So they're kind of working against each other. So this part here wouldn't get as high and that part there uh, wouldn't be as low. So you'd still get tides, but it wouldn't be as high there and it wouldn't be as low there. So that might be more like... So this part here would be a little bit higher and this part here would be a little bit lower. So when the moon's at position A and C, you still get tides, but your high tides are gonna be low, relatively low, and your low tides aren't gonna be that low, so they're not gonna change that much. Right. Uh, another thing with a diagram like this is it could show you where the eclipses are. There's two types of eclipses. Uh, probably the more famous one is a solar eclipse. Uh, a solar eclipse would happen when the moon's at position B, because it's blocking out the sun from getting to the earth. So position B would be a solar eclipse. A uh, lunar eclipse is when the moon is at position D, because what happens during a lunar eclipse is the earth blocks out the sun's rays from getting to the moon. Uh, so what you should notice is that during eclipses, if B and D is when there's eclipses, during eclipses, you have really high tides and really low tides. Now, um, a common misconception when you look at a diagram like this um, is that, well, if that's where the moon is during a solar eclipse and it takes, you know, a month for the moon to go around the Earth, shouldn't we have a solar eclipse every month? Um, well, on this diagram, it looks like that. But what you have to remember is this is only a two-dimensional diagram. Um, there's also factors this way. So, like, for example... Um, 
so like, uh, like right now, this is between me and the camera. I can still see the camera. Right now, this is between me and the camera, but I can still see the camera. Only when, when it's lined up right there, does it block out the camera. Kind of the same idea with eclipses. Um, it's only when things are all lined up properly this way too, that you're gonna get the eclipse. So, because these things aren't always on the same level. So that's why you only get eclipses once in a while. All right, uh, next. Probably the thing people notice most about the moon is the phases of the moon. And that's the change in the illuminated surface of the moon as viewed from the Earth. All right, so let me show you how the phases of the moon work. All right, so here's the moon going around the Earth. Now, the moon doesn't make its own light. All the moon does is reflect light from the sun. So there's always one half the moon lit up. It's going to be the side of the moon facing the sun. Right. Now, how we get the phase of the sun is depending on how much of that white part, the lit up part, is facing the Earth. So let's say, for example, when the moon's at that position right there. If I'm like a little dude right there, looking at the moon, um, the dark part's facing away from me. It's just the white part facing me. So I only see the white part. I don't see the dark part. So that would be a full moon. The moon would look like that. All right. um, if I'm over here on the Earth and the moon's over here in its orbit, now when I look at the moon, the white part's facing away from me. It's just the black part facing the Earth. So you don't see any of the white part of the moon. That's called a new moon. All right. In this spot right here, all right, I'm looking up at the moon. I can only see the part that's facing me. So as I look up, I'm going to see half dark on the right side, half light on the left side. So the moon would look like that. So that would be a quarter moon. Now, over here, uh, when I look over here, I'm looking this way, and what I'm going to see is mostly dark on the right, with a sliver of left and sliver of light on the left. So that'd be a crescent moon right there. In this spot, I'm looking this way. Um, again, I can only see the part that's facing me, so I look up, it's going to be a sliver of dark in the left, or excuse me, sliver of dark in the right, mostly dark in the left, so it's going to look kind of like that. It's a gibbous moon. Right. Now, the bottom half of the chart is a little bit harder to describe, because um, again, this, this is something that's going on in three dimensions that I'm trying to draw in a two-dimensional diagram, so it's a little bit trickier to visualize. Um, now, when the moon's in that position, try to imagine yourself that little dude right there looking that way, all right? So that little dude looking this way, again, he's only going to see half the, half the moon, but when he's looking this way, the lit up half is going to be on the right-hand side. So it's going to be another quarter, but it's going to be light on that side. And over here... If I'm looking that way, I'm going to see mostly dark on the left with a sliver of light in the right. So it's going to look like that. It's going to be another crescent moon. And then uh, over here, I'm looking this way. 
What I'm going to see is mostly light on the right with a little sliver on the dark, a little sliver on the left of darkness. So it's going to look like that, which is another gibbous moon. So it goes uh, new moon, new crescent, first quarter, new gibbous, full moon, old gibbous, third quarter, uh, old crescent, and then new moon again. Now, the amount of time it takes to go from one new moon to the next new moon is 29 and a half days. All right. Um, now, you might be like, well, wait a minute. Back over here, I said the amount of time it takes to, for the moon to go around the Earth is 27 and a third days. Shouldn't those two numbers be the same? Well, what you got to remember is that the Earth's not just standing still right there. Um, as the moon is going around the Earth, the Earth is going around the sun. So as a result, uh, the moon actually has to go, because as the moon's going around the Earth, the Earth's not going to be in that spot anymore. During the course of the month, the Earth's going to move like up there someplace. So the moon actually has to go all the way around once and then a little bit further to get to the next new moon spot. So that's why those two numbers aren't the same. It's because the Earth is moving while the moon is going around it. So the amount of time from one new moon to the next new moon is 29 and a half days. And that's what like the, that's what, like, the old tiny month was, was that right there. All right, um, so that is, how you, oh, one other thing I want to point out. Uh, when you're going from the dark part and the amount of white part of the moon is getting bigger and bigger, uh, the moon is said to be waxing. So from here to here, the moon is waxing. That means every single night, it's going to have a little bit more of a white part than the night before. Now, once I get to the full moon and I go from here to here, so every single night there's going to be a little bit less of a white part, the moon is said to be waning. So waxing moon, the white part's getting bigger. Waning moon, the white part's getting smaller. So that's some other terms you hear sometimes with uh, describing the phase of the moon. And that is pretty much it. Okay.